America. Welcome in. Welcome back. This is the legacy right with Elizander Spooner behind me. Here, I'll let you see him instead of my ugly face. There's Lysander Spooner. The yeah, the proprietor of American Letter Company. So American Mail Letter Company. Exactly. What you said. So I am the legacy of Jennifer and Kaiser. I am Zachary Kaiser, El Capitan to you, Andrew. I am your captain. Call me Picard. You are my number one. Number two, when I really need to take a shit. But number one, because you are my R William Riker. That's Andrew Joseph. We got another special guest for you today. And uh, we're going to talk about all things that are just going on crazy in the UK. And then we're going to discuss a little bit about defibrillators and uh, some uh, organizations that are trying to benefit people in the public without the fucking government. So before that, though, anything to plug away, Andrew, or add to, to your intro? Or it's right above me, T dot me slash Utaku sauce. There you go. Go uh head over to that tele that telegram where you can get memes, you can get anime, you can get politics without the bullshit of Twitter. Unless I decide to go in there and shit post. But that's just because God, I love you all. <laughs> God help us all. <laughs> so uh but with that, I'd like to welcome uh Stephen McNamara. From the great land of Scotland, the land of my forefathers, not Andrew. He's he's from Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How you doing today, Stephen? I'm doing well. And yourself? I'm doing all right. So, <laughs> so it's evening for you. It's afternoon over here. So, I see you're winding down for the evening. So, I am um, um, got to wind down at some point. Mm -hmm. Too busy winding people up through the day, so I've got to wind myself down at night. <laughs> exactly. It's sometimes it's fun though. It's it is fun to wind people up and get them to get them a little upset, get hurt their feelings. <laughs> I know. And the great thing about it is you don't have to say anything nasty. You just have to, you know, comment about the moral issues of tax. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the next thing they're taking it is like the world you're wanting the world to end. <laughs> mm. Oh no, taxation! He's going against taxation. Uh, they we need taxes. The freedoms. How will we fund the libraries? <laughs> <laughs> how would we? How would we fund the libraries? The oh, the roads, my roads. <laughs> how would we build the roads? That's my favorite one. So if if we ever if we ever happen to have an anarchist utopia, which I fail to see that happening anytime soon, because utopia is not existent, what will the what will the status do with the roads? That's my first question of the day. <laughs> so but uh let's get started though. I mean, Stephen, if you want to introduce yourself, I mean plug away on any uh any works, any uh what you've been up to uh this whole time other than uh pissing off the plebeian lefties of of the Twitter verse. <laughs> so what's that, the, does, what... that does seem to be a full time job these days. And um, because even even after you've you know sometimes it's like like I've got five minutes, I'll jump onto Twitter and see what's going on. And there's just this proverbial bomb that's been dropped. <laughs> Mm -hmm. there's all these notifications and that i'll deal with that later <laughs> <laughs> it it does seem like it becomes a full-time job like you can't you jump on for like try to jump on for like five minutes in the morning or something next thing you know you you're blowing up an entire thread just shit posting <laughs> and telling people with moral truths really so. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it gets ugly then somebody has to throw out a picture and say look at this guy that's the funny part is the pictures <laughs> all all i do is ask questions and yeah. suddenly i'm some sort of racist transphobe gun nut mm -hmm. um who wants to destroy the world and it's like yeah okay <laughs> mm -hmm. where, where exactly did i say these mm -hmm. things <laughs> <clears throat> right right where you said that taxation is not 
is not what we need. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't need something it right else now. We, we could use it maybe <clears throat> never. Yeah. <laughs> coercion is uh coercion and force and intimidation is wrong, but uh but hey. Yeah. I'm gonna post your picture. Because <laughs> I like you. <laughs> but I'm not uh, shit posting on Twitter or X or whatever they want to call it these days. Mm -hmm. um, I have so many trans jokes about Elon Musk just now, he's Twitter uh his ex stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um but we won't go down that road tonight. Uh but usually I do get involved um in politics quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've just been through a general election campaign. Sort of took mm -hmm. it easy this time. I didn't really do too much. Uh, I was tied up with work anyway, so I wasn't even around. So I couldn't attend any hustings or do any sort of campaigning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I come back on. Uh, I come back the night before the election. Got myself some rest, and then went down. Uh, touring around some of the polling stations, seeing a lot of folk and having a yap away with other candidates and stuff. It was actually quite, oh, excuse me, at the count, um, there was uh, a Green candidate mm -hmm. uh, for, for the Scottish Greens there. Uh, oh, forgive me, I can't remember her name. Um, seemed like a lovely lass. Mm -hmm. And she seen me standing, watching as the, the ballot papers are all being put together and counted. <clears throat> and she kind of, she didn't recognise me at first. Um, and I had a different colour identity badge from everyone else. Um, and she was like, oh, sorry, I thought you worked here. And I says, no, my badge is the same colour as yours. <laughs> and she's like, oh, Oh, I don't think we're supposed to be talking to each other. And I says, Is this your first count that you've been to? And she's like, Yeah, I've not been in an election before. I says, Don't worry. The the arguing, the debates and everything are over. Right? Mm -hmm. We're here just to view the count. The polls co have closed. We're here to view the count. We're all friends in this space, you know. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the arguing, the fighting, the bickering's all done and dusted, and we've kept it, you know, non violent, shall we say? <laughs> um, and we've, we've, we've kept it, you know, in Command Lincoln Loudon, where, where we stood, um, it is largely quite, um, we don't tend to have any controversy, um, at, at balance or elections, um. <clears throat> Even five years ago, when my wife stood as a libertarian candidate, um, she, she took not well at the uh, the count and um, uh, one of the, uh, the the MSP for the area, one of the elected members of parliament, um, mm -hmm. came along, uh, offered us some water and things and stuff like that. So you know, when when all the arguing and bickering's done. And the counts there were all friends, and I happened to just, uh, you know, she was good enough to stay and listen, and I pointed out some of the different things around mm -hmm. and, and what she can expect to see and things like that. Um, and you know, she was, she was, I think she was actually quite relieved, um, not to get into a debate or anything. Uh, I, I don't know what um, she was expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, some mass rami or arguments and stuff like that. Uh, but that, you know, we are we are very lucky in Kilmarnock. Um, most of the people that run in the elections in these areas, be it council or uh, Westminster or Holyrood, things like that, mm -hmm. um, every single one of them would be able to, uh, myself included, would be able to jump down to a pub together um, and share a laugh over a drink mm -hmm. um, and then leave the political discussion to another time. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, arguments to another time. Um, and it's good that way. Um, so it's, uh, I think, um, let's see, Scottish Holyrood is the next planned election 
for myself, which is a couple of years off now. It's not till 2026. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've got a bit of respite and breathing space. But, you know, that wouldn't stop me getting out and about and, uh, you know, getting involved and having debates and things like that. Mm -hmm. get, your, gradually, get your name out. Yeah, yeah and I'm gradually, very slowly, um, getting a general increase of people willing to vote for me. Um, mm -hmm. Albeit, albeit it is still very low numbers. I uh, wouldn't expect anything else. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when you actually sit down and have a rational conversation with someone, it's like, actually, you're not actually all that bad a person. Um, and, you know, I don't agree with everything you say, but I don't think my vote would be completely wasted on you. Because mm -hmm. you'd be at least different <clears throat> or willing to stand up and ask questions that the other folk, even people I would normally vote for, they don't ask. You know, so you get the chance to speak to people um, mm -hmm. and they actually, you know, you're not just this random uh, nuisance on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And that's what it's about, right? Like trying to find that discourse with people. And I mean, which you don't see a whole lot, but I mean, it's, it's if you can sit down with somebody and actually have that rational discussion, then you could at least get the message across. You might not necessarily get their vote because they're probably still stuck on the the fuckery that we have in both of our countries. But it's I mean, with uh with politics and what it's become. So they're kind of tied in with their parties, but at least you can hopefully get that message and then maybe that inkling of something comes out and they say, Oh well, I'm gonna vote for Steven instead of uh Joe Blow blows basically i mean <laughs> so yeah. and but yeah that's what we are missing is discourse so it's kind of nice that you say like you can go run down to the pub with most of these uh electorate officials and like all these all these people that just ran and then all of a sudden you can just go have a beer together it's like that's awesome yeah exactly yeah. and it's the way politics should be it really mm -hmm. is it's it's mm -hmm. disheartening you know, the, the things that, that, you know, an assassination attempt on Trump and stuff like that, that's, there's no place in politics for that. Um, mm -hmm. and you should never get to that sort of stage. Sadly, though, because of the increasing powers that governments are taking for themselves and their near dystopian nightmares that they're imposing upon us, it does mm -hmm. push the extreme ends of both, you know, left and right, um, to mm -hmm. say, no, maybe maybe it's time for something other than voting at a polling booth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's the, the unintended consequence of democracy, is that mm -hmm. you're going to be always excluding people. It's just mob rule with extra steps to try and mm -hmm. calm the, the worst of the nutters. Um, and keep them quite isolated. Uh, and the the kind of general populace has this general feeling, oh, well, it's, it's what the people wanted. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, it's, I'm, I'm one of these people, I like to get um, dug in with the figures. And it, one of the, I think was it the last, oh, I think was it the last... Holyrood election. Yeah, uh, the last Holyrood election 20, 2021 was, uh, 2021, with the mm -hmm. Scottish Parliament had, had an election. And when you actually boiled it down, it was something that only 11% of Scotland's population actually voted for the party mm -hmm. that got the majority mm -hmm. of seats. And that's yes. actually quite scary, you know. They're getting over mm -hmm. fifty percent of the reputation uh, of the representation within a parliament, within a dem, dem you know, a democracy parliament um, or a democratic parliament, um, mm -hmm. with only eleven percent of the population that 
actually mm-hmm. voted for them. But, you know, the media, um, your polling reports and everything else say, oh, well, 50% of, you know, voters mm-hmm. are going to vote this way. Um, so they're going to get, but they're missing out everyone who doesn't vote, who can't vote, mm-hmm. who isn't allowed to vote. They miss all that out. And that's mm-hmm. why they keep getting these figures that look as though they've got a huge, rep, you know, mm-hmm. a huge result. And the reality couldn't be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, and the worse that gets, the more you will see of extremists, um, you know, coming on to the, the forefront of politics. Mm-hmm. That's That's what makes it... It makes it fearful because at the end of the day, the government's response is to do something, and that usually involves more laws. And those more laws end up with unintended consequences, such as extraditing somebody from mm-hmm. Australia for posting something on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how on yeah. earth? How on earth can can we actually stand back and actually allow a government to threaten citizens of another country? with extradition mm-hmm. for having the audacity to have an opinion or to mm-hmm. say something that, you know, maybe somebody else doesn't like, you know, that's free speech. Is a, mm-hmm. It's a binary issue. You either have it or you don't. There's no such thing as, oh, I support free speech, but, mm-hmm. you know, or accept or whatever. Uh, no, it's either you support free speech or you don't. And as mm-hmm. soon as you use the word but, you're lying, you know, because you don't support free speech. Mm-hmm. No. I'm, be, I'm on, I'm on the, uh, the, the agreement with like Michael Malice when I, when I say this, like there's really no such thing as free speech because there's only speech. Because if we can only, if we lived in a truly free society, then we would all basically, we can all agree to just divorce one another if we don't want to hear anybody speak like i could just say steven shut the hell up andrew get the hell out of my face <laughs> i mean and walk away don't even have a conversation and exactly I, and that's the way it should be mm-hmm. and and that's where i look at it like if by calling it free speech that's giving it that's g- allowing the dystopians to win in my opinion because then you're basically saying you're allowing them to dictate uh encroach what it, yeah you're, you're allowed to encroach, allow them to dictate and encroach on uh, whatever they deem is free speech, MSP, and then everything yeah. else is yeah, everything else is hate speech or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, it's so terrible. absolutely mm-hmm. terrible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, I mean this this whole ordeal that's going on right now in the UK with, I mean they're they're basically there. It sounds like they. It's been going on for a while. Like, what was it? Two thousand three was the was the Communications Act, and you don't, of course. And then I, they had something. I think in twenty ten, I think where they renewed it or re, expanded on it. So, and now yeah, you're seeing about crazy, yeah. Mm-hmm, and now you're seeing the effects of it now. And then, of course, they're threatening other countries, like. <laughs> Well, I mean, if they want world, if they want the war of eighteen twelve again, I guess, I guess they can impress us and jail us Americans for free speech <laughs> issues. <laughs> now it's time for oh. us to invade. Yes. <laughs> Truth be told, we invaded. We we invaded them. We invaded <laughs> Canada. <laughs> we still <laughs> invaded. <laughs> so. <laughs> but it, it is it, it it seems like it's just it's just the world's getting crazy i mean and and i don't know what else to what else is going to happen before it gets any worse because it's going to have to get even worse than it is now before it gets better so and as much as we, we've all heard the fallacies of the slippery slope but mm. you know, time and again we see examples um and it's it's easy enough to get dragged down that rabbit hole, um, but what is what is the next step that the government is going to do? Because when you know 
they've already started. They extradited someone in December from Australia for posting mm-hmm. stuff on Facebook. The the London uh, police commissioner is, mm-hmm. you know, just last week threatened the Americans um, mm-hmm. with extradition for um, for posting on social media. So mm-hmm. what what's what is the next stage? You know what, uh, what what is next? What what else are they going to find that they disagree with, and they're suddenly going to say, "Well, you know, uh, we'll we'll imprison you for just six months for saying this," mm-hmm. um, and you eventually, you know, slippery slope stuff. Um, but do we get to the stage where uh, modern day um, proper political opponents? Are getting mm-hmm. jailed for what they say. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, yeah. just just the other day, an elected councillor, um, it was it was a green councillor. Um, he was arrested, um, for posting, uh, or he was filmed at a protest, um, threatening to you know demanding throats were cut and stuff like that. Pretty. Mm-hmm. Pretty outrageous, you know. Um, on on a par with what uh, right wingers or the, the people being classed as far right, um, mm-hmm. it was on a par with what they were getting arrested for, and that, that it kind of blew up, and there was a lot of pressure, and the police eventually went and arrested them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so the, they've got. I think, you know, that was just. Dare I say it was that just tokenism? Mm. You know, because we've we've seen we've seen all the videos um of extreme left wing protests like just stop mm-hmm. oil blockading roads with people dying in the backs of ambulances mm-hmm. uh, trying to get to hospital um and, and lots of other things, you know, real impact on on you know ordinary working people trying mm-hmm. to go about their ordinary lives. And you get these protesters, and as soon as somebody gets out of their car to argue with them and try to get them to move, the police step in and protect the protesters instead of mm-hmm. dealing with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they were openly breaking laws, um, vandalising and damaging, you know, priceless artwork in museums and things, mm. uh, and getting away with it. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd maybe be arrested, but then just let out like a few hours later. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe get a slap in the wrist at the court. But say some, you know, if you're perceived, you don't even have to be right wing. If you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time now, you know, if you happen to be, <laughs> as as someone put it, putting their bins out as a protest is going past, you could be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> just for being yeah. in the proximity of mm-hmm. of a protest that the government doesn't like, yeah. Uh, regardless of you know, I, th- I think aye, there was someone who I can't remember the chap's name. Young fellow got arrested. He was standing um, near the protest. He was filming with his phone. Uh, he was filming the protest and putting clips of it up online. Mm-hmm. And he was arrested for it. <laughs> and he wasn't actually there to protest. He just happened to be standing at the sidelines going, oh, look, this is interesting. Wow, oh, this is... Mm-hmm. Oh, it's all happening here. And he got lifted for it. Um, you know, so... It's... It's... You know, it's, it's what I say to, to other folk on other podcasts and things like that. Um, I do mm-hmm. have to be careful with what I say online, what I do. Yeah. Um, and I try to be, um, as much as I try to uh, antagonise some people into, um, you know, some sort of inflammatory response, I certainly don't use or threaten um, or incite anything more mm-hmm. than you ask questions, you know. Mm-hmm. Is, this a, is this the start of a civil war? Is that me inciting to violence? No, I'm asking the question. Is this the start mm-hmm. of a civil war? Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it is a shame that uh, it seems like speaking of civil war that it, people are they just can't they can't answer questions anymore. I mean, at least online. And I think I think if you can find people in in real life that can just sit there and have a beer with you or have a tea with you and smoke a cigar and just chit chat about anything but politics or even if you do say talk about politics you can actually have a civil conversation but then you jump online and it's just it gets to be a fiasco because i guess because most most people are somewhat anonymous obviously they're not completely anonymous even if they are because of their servers i mean unless they're using a proxy but even then you can you can governments can figure out how to get through those walls they have the technology they can rebuild it so but, yeah, but that's that's what it seems like is like yeah, social media is it's great and it's been i'm like look at us we're talking andrew's in south carolina i'm in indiana here in the u.s and we're talking to you from scotland like that's what's great about the internet and social media but then you have you have the cons where you're just gonna have just all this drivel and infighting and just it's kind of sad that yeah that we've we've allowed the internet to become to make us more tribal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the tribals landing not on um uh natural boundaries or or anything like that it's actually landing mm -hmm. political aspects you know, they're and it's it's dividing entire families and mm -hmm. you know putting friendships and workplaces mm -hmm. and everything in jeopardy simply because people, uh, you know, struggle to have a civil conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does it blows out of proportion? You ask a question online, and everything blows out of proportion, and the next thing you're getting called all the all the names under the sun. Mm -hmm. so, I'm entitled to an opinion just as anyone else is. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to listen to it if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. But some of them just can't help themselves. That's yeah. what it sounds like. I mean, <laughs> sometimes I can't help myself either. That's what I like about federated networks, honestly, because like federated networks, if we had more like overt federated network systems um, on the, the mainstream social medias, make them similar to that. Then you could allow people to freedom to actually uh, just ch pick and choose what their timeline feed really is. And then they can yeah. literally, they don't even have to be a part of everything. You don't have to have all this argument. Every so often somebody from one opposing side would find themselves on the opposing side's feed because maybe they just, they read something a little too much of something that opened up that feed. But then most of the time you're just kind of in your own little echo chamber. Like maybe that's how the internet should be. Like just let people have their own echo chamber to escape life. And then, and then they can, they won't be on the internet 24 seven, maybe because nobody yeah. wants to, yeah, nobody wants to be on, be, online just yelling at themselves for two or three hours or longer well, i mean so. they've they already have the people block people all the time so what's the point of, what's the difference between doing that and just blocking the whatever you don't want to see in yeah, your feed? Exactly. well most most people don't block them most people don't even block or mute most of these most of the people that want to start to start the trash the trash talk and shit posts. I mean, they're they're gonna do it regardless. They want mm. you to block them. <laughs> <laughs> and me, I'm not blocking you. I don't. I, I want you to have your opinion. Block. What's block? So, what is block? Only thing I block in, in, in on on Twitter is a bunch of sex bots. <laughs> mm. I know they're so frustrating. It's 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 the one downside. Mm -hmm. um, I really wish you know the the X group or Twitter, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them. Mm -hmm. I really wish they would, you know, focus on that. 
Mm-hmm. It's the one thing, if anything, it's the one thing that just. Yeah. I mean, there was there was um, I set up an account for for this non profit, um, and it was instantly hit with all these followers, and it was just they weren't real people. It was just bots. And, you know, the first messages through were these spam bots. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, come on, sort, sort yourselves out. <laughs> you know, it's, you it, it. I've barely even set up the Twitter handle and I'm already getting the, the followers and the bots going, mm-hmm. you know, what on earth? Mm-hmm. But that's, that's, that's the point. Uh, no, no. Uh, well, one of the things that I do, you know, I do do other things to try and actually promote liberty, as you know, uh, mm-hmm. and one of the reasons why you, you've actually invited me on, um, yeah. and that was to talk about the, the community work and things. Mm-hmm. Um, up until I hurt my back a, a few couple of years ago, uh, a few years ago now, um, I would try and do um, a bit of guerrilla gardening, as I called it. And I would just pick somewhere and tidy it up mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, not actually take credit for it. I would just, mm-hmm. and then I ended up, there was a church mm-hmm. nearby to my, my home um, and it had overgrown uh, through the COVID year. Um, and it was a complete jungle. It was a big, big bit of land. Um, and there was no way I could just uh, <laughs> nip in one night and just quickly tidy it up. This this was going to take weeks and months of work. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I did actually um, approach the church and ask permission to to start volunteering my time and you know uh, you know hopefully trying keeping top of it. And I wasn't always, I mean, the, the estate was huge, far too much for one person who wasn't, you know, full-time. Uh, if, if, it, if it was a full-time gardener, um, an actual mm-hmm. employed job, yeah, it could be done by one person, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, not just nipping in for, um, you know, even, like, I was putting in, 10 or so hours a week um, and still couldn't keep on top of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did, uh, you know, I, I did, if I had a few days off work or a nice dry spell, I took advantage and, you know, would nip up and uh, the kids would come up sometimes to play a bit with the football and or would take a picnic up and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I hurt my back, as already mentioned, and um, you know, just I struggled to find mm-hmm. uh, meaning in what I was doing locally. It, it was just uh, I couldn't physically lend my time to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but but you know things have picked up, and I've I've been working away, <coughs> um, and uh, my wife was getting worse and worse. Uh, she was hoping to be be on this and. Um, but she's had four strokes now. Um, she's got heart mm. failure, things like that. Mm. Um, wow. And we've been talking about, you know, she keeps taking these seizures as well, pretty severe ones. Mm. Um, and we, we kept discussing about getting a defibrillator for the house. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it was always that. You know, the discussion was there and it's like, ah, yeah, maybe we should. And you look into it and it's such an expense. These these things can be thousands of pounds. Um, and it ended up, uh, it just sort of, um, it was always sort of mentioned from time to time, uh, will we put something aside for this and try and get something or look into it and see what's needed and this, that. Um, <clears throat> And it actually took, um, back in February, I actually took, um, I was standing at a bus stop and someone had a heart attack. I went into cardiac arrest mm. um, right there in the street. 
uh, and I managed to wow. start the CPR and things. I've no idea whether the it was an older gentleman, no idea of the outcome. Um, I really don't. Uh, I'd like to think he's survived and he's back with his family and looking after himself. Um, but he was in a pretty bad way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I did. I didn't have any anything with me. All I had was a couple of uh, um, more panicking bystanders, <laughs> bystanders, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. bystanders who, who didn't know what they were doing. I'd somebody offered to go and get a first aid kit, and it's like, I don't think a little sticking plaster is going to fix this then. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and there there was a nurse in her NHS uniform there, uh, and she was clueless because, and, and no offence to her as an individual, um, mm-hmm. but she was a paediatric nurse, um, and knew nothing or very little about the adult body. She didn't know first mm. aid, didn't know what CPR was or anything, um, wow. you know, and. She was heavily relying on taking cues from me as to what to do. And mm-hmm. thankfully, um, I have had a lot of first aid training. I've, I've done mm-hmm. volunteering um, down at the beach for a couple of years. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been first aided in workplaces and things like that. Uh, I've actually seen um, and been there for three uh, cardiac arrests before this one here in February. Um and <laughs> with the state of the NHS and with the health service in Scotland is mm-hmm. higher at the moment, you know, um, it's really really bleak. It took over twenty minutes for the first ambulance to arrive, uh, and and I'm hearing quite a lot in Scotland that is quite commonplace. Ambulance times are are through the roof at the moment. So even for the most severe, if someone has is dead in the street, um, mm-hmm. if you don't have someone, right, if, if you've basically been into cardiac arrest um, and you don't have someone beside you who knows CPR, um, who, who has access to a defibrillator, um, then your chances of surviving are pretty much nil. Um, it, you know, we often joke as libertarians, yeah, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. Mm-hmm. When minutes count, our ambulances are only hours away. Yeah. It's it's really, really scary. And it's, I think, was it um, just a year ago, uh, I'm sure, was it a year or so ago, our waiting times... Um, our accident and emergency waiting times, the government's target is four hours, has been like that for years. Mm. Four hours from attending an accident and emergency to being seen and getting your treatment started. Mm. That's the government's targets. Um, I knew someone who waited 36 hours oh um, between getting picked up by the ambulance they were sat outside the hospital in an ambulance overnight. <coughs> they were brought in on a stretcher and left in a corridor. Hmm. Between getting picked up by the ambulance and being seen by the first doctor available to see that person, that was 36 hours. Um, oh the horror stories, the absolute horror stories of, of worse situations as well. That wasn't even the worst. And at the time, Ethiopia, I don't know if any of you remember the, the you know, the, the droughts and the food crises in Ethiopia all mm-hmm. years ago. And um, I know here in the UK, uh, there was all the big, uh, you know, government and BBC fundraising efforts for helping people in Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, at the time when Scotland was having all these crises and, taking two or three days for um, people to be seen at, at, at hospitals. Ethiopia got <laughs> their accident and emergency waiting times were under four hours. Wow. 
third world countries oh, healthcare yeah. was perform outperforming by miles the Scottish healthcare of first world country. You know, mm-hmm. what used to be a leading country right around the world, they always look to the Scots for innovation and for the best of everything. Mm-hmm. And now all we have is the worst. We have near dystopian government trying to mm-hmm. dictate what people can 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 and can't talk about. Um, we've got healthcare. Uh, you know, it's just it's pretty much non-existent. Um, and a police force that's just oh, it's absolutely bizarre. It's it's just it's unthinkable what what's you know some of the things that's happening mm-hmm. and, and they use it's there's a common thing that even if you haven't broken the law if you've upset someone they will use the police as a method of punishment so it's what we call the process as the punishment so if someone complains about something you've said online. Um, the police will come, they'll raid your house with a warrant, they'll take all your devices, your computers, they'll take your tablets off your children. Hmm. And you won't see them for years. That's it, it's gone. You have to go and buy all new stuff. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they'll decide whether they're actually um, going to charge you with something or not. It is absolutely diabolical. It's, you know... yeah. Punishment without trial, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if they do charge you, you know, it's two or three years before you even get your day in court for a trial. Uh, you know, ultimately, you might even be found not guilty um, if you truly have done nothing wrong that is just malicious. But that's mm-hmm. years of your life wasted. Mm-hmm. Thousands of pounds of your property gone. It's cost you thousands in legal fees that you can't claim back either. <coughs> and they do say that they're trying not to damage your stuff, but they don't guarantee it. Um, and it's when, you know, even if you've given your passwords across and your your codes to, you know, your pins and everything to, to see and get into the devices, um, they'll still use software um, that, that just basically destroys the software on, on your drives. So even if you've done nothing wrong and you get all your stuff back, it's virtually unusable mm-hmm. most of the time. Um, and it's it's quite scary. Uh, but we're left in a situation now that, you know, with healthcare especially, mm-hmm. there's, there's nothing uh, anyone can do Um the NHS is the National Health Service is um, a monopolised service. Um, so there's a lot of things, you know, that the leftists you'll hear, oh, just go private if you don't like the NHS. And so like, mm-hmm. I wish I could. But there's so much stuff monopolised and outlawed. We're not allowed to, uh, you know, if, if I'm sick from work, I used to go to a private GP. Mm-hmm. And I discovered this, but I was sick and I had to take some time off work just when I hurt my back. Um, and I ended up with a walking stick and stuff, it was pretty bad. Hmm. <coughs> I got a sick clean for two weeks, and it, uh, and I asked, I, I, I remember at the end of the two weeks, come back for another appointment, and it was an online appointment, nothing special. Um, and going back and saying, look, I'm still not ready to go back to work. And the GP said, well, sorry, I can't write you another sick claim. It's illegal. Um, mm. If you want a sick claim beyond two weeks, you have to go to a government-supplied doctor. Um, to, Interesting. To, yeah. And it's not mm. the only thing. You know, it's, it's bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. There's so many things. Um, like, for example, um, prescriptions, you know, you can go to a private GP for most of your prescriptions, but if you're wanting to schedule one or two drugs, the, um, you know, the, basically the good painkillers, as some folk would call them, the addictive stuff, mm-hmm. you have to go to a government doctor. Um, you can't just 
uh, use your own private doctor. Yeah. Uh, some surgeries, um, there's no private option because it's outlawed. <clears throat> it's just, it's absolutely bizarre. And we have this mm. industry here in Scotland um, where people do go abroad for private care because mm -hmm. they can't get it here in the NHS. And the private sector has had it monopolised, it's outlawed. So um, it is, it's, it's just absolutely shocking. I mean, mm -hmm. we see these fundraisers all the time or, you know, uh, what was it? A, a recent one was a little girl, Ava or something, um, and they were fundraising all, you know, cans collecting in the shops all around the town. And people uh, doing fundraiser car washes, you know, your car sales places doing fundraiser car washes and stuff like that, all to raise money so that this little girl could go to America to get treatment that she needed because she couldn't get it on the NHS. Uh, and the stories like that all the time. <clears throat> um, so yeah. basically, if if you're ever in Scotland, don't get ill in Scotland. Um, mm -hmm. That's it's just not going to be worthwhile. But and that's and, and I'll I'll let you get back to your story, but just to just to mention something like when you start messing with the kids, I mean that's. That's just outright. That's just outright satanic. I mean, that's evil. Yeah. Especially when you start messing with the children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's not fair on the children. They mm -hmm. rely on the adults to be responsible and to be caring mm -hmm. and to provide. That they're too young to survive without mm -hmm. without the help. They need the adults to make the right decisions and that's not mm -hmm. happening at a government level and it's been filtering down through every layer of government um to to just utter incompetence in some some instances uh, and just downright evil in others <coughs> but you know back, back in february when that incident happened um my wife and i to say you know it's definitely time we've done something and being libertarians uh, we we decided that you know we're not going to go down the route of oh the government needs to do something. Um, mm -hmm. We're not that way inclined, and it would be hypocritical actually, you know, for, for us to <laughs> to to go and argue that after um, you know pronouncing the the positivities of libertarianism. Um, mm -hmm. So we we started fundraising ourselves <clears throat> and started this. Um, public transport automated defibrillators um, sort of cause. And that is uh, where we try to provide basically defibrillators and, you know, get them installed onto public transport. Mm -hmm. These things, the <laughs> Velcro thing, mm. uh, they just little battery packs with mm -hmm. um, devices and things attached. Very easy to use. Um, you don't need training. Um, the machine, basically, you switch it on and mm -hmm. it walks you through what it is you need to do and things like that. Um, I haven't, this is a brand new one. I haven't yet set it up. They are really cool. I mean, I've yeah, taken uh, CPR classes because I'm CPR certified as well. So they're really, really cool, Andrew. Like, yeah, did you, did you get, the, did you get yeah. the training for these as well? Yes. Yeah, we call them. Uh, we call them AEDs over here. So yeah, I uh, guess yeah. the D is defilable. Is defilable. Yeah. Like, no, can't even speak. Aut automated <laughs> external defibrillator. Yep. So uh, we just call it, we're we're stupid Americans, so we we call it we stay short. But yeah, but they are they're really cool. You're giving yourself so, text. <laughs> there we go. So, this is an emergency. <coughs> the green on off button. So I'll leave that to do its little test. Shock button, test. <laughs> if the orange button is flashing, press it. Verify. On off button, test. Press the green on off button now. Verify. 
Huh. Testing. I better not hold it too close. Huh? <laughs> Testing. Right. <laughs> right. These things uh, are great because even if you're completely yeah. untrained, you just switch it on and it will talk you through and tell you yeah. what to do. Mm-hmm. You have these, um, I'll not pull everything out, Testing. but you have these pads. Oops. <laughs> Says me, I'll not pull everything Testing. out. Um, and you stick them on. Testing. Mm-hmm. No, the top side Ready is Ready for use. There we go, ready for use. So, up at the top side, down at the side. Like, yeah, exactly. Right, right about here. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And uh, it will then measure if someone, it will recognise if someone's breathing, it will recognise if, if they have any sort of heart rate going. It will tell you, okay, um, check patient. So you would just, you know, listen for breathing and things. It'll maybe say, right, start CPR, start chest compressions, um, mm-hmm. at which point you're, you're starting the process there. Um, just it, the machine talks you through it. So even if you've never used one before, even if mm-hmm. you didn't know what CPR was, the machine talks you through it. Um, mm-hmm. And you do that, with, I mean, obviously, if you, you'll be on the phone to a call handler, um, you've dialed your emergency number. 999 here in Scotland and uh, mm-hmm. one for yourselves in America um, mm-hmm. and 111 in Canada right yeah who cares about Canada 112 in the EU and Europe yeah something like that so mm-hmm. it's, yeah it's uh, uh, so, so there's different numbers but I, my understanding mm-hmm. is that even regardless of which country you're in if you dial any of those numbers mm-hmm. Automatically mm-hmm. direct you to your local emergency service. Mm-hmm. Um, That's so what I've heard. If you happen to forget that you've come to Scotland and you dial nine one one, it'll probably direct you through to nine nine nine. Don't we'll just get don't now. test it at home. <laughs> <laughs> you get into the bother. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so we decided we were going to fundraise. We managed to um, uh, get it. Uh, you know, up and running, we've, we've got the account up and running, we've got uh, the membership, the donations and everything else. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> still doing some work on the uh, website at the moment. Um, we've got a Twitter page up and running, ptad underscore Scotland mm-hmm. is a Twitter handle. Um, there's a Facebook page for it as well um, and, and other stuff. Uh, and it's, it's great and um, we do have a few donors now. We've been, ab- been able to, this is our uh, third um, uh, defibrillator we've managed to, to source. Mm-hmm. They are not cheap. Um, they really aren't. On average, oh, yeah. yeah, on average, um, between purchasing or leasing or renting or whatever way as you fund the actual machine, then you've got the maintenance and top of it, you've got to have um, insurance. So if it gets mm-hmm. stolen or if it's actually needed for an emergency and gets used, uh, mm-hmm. you have to be able to go and get it replaced or serviced. Um, you know, so, uh, and again, those are not cheap. The pads are single mm-hmm. use. Um, mm-hmm. It's not always obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the pads are there. Um uh, and actually for adults and you get this little key uh, I won't open up but there's a little key in there and you stick that into the back of the machine mm. um, so hold up a bit okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and that lets that lets the machine know that it's measuring for a child uh, for an infant oh, okay. um, under 8 year old essentially mm-hmm. Um <coughs> so the shots will be different. Mm-hmm. The placement is slightly different. Mm-hmm. There's a child that's middle of the chest, back of the chest, eh, back of the chest, um, and, you've and you can your, uh, your your compressions are are lighter. Um, mm-hmm. And you can get different pads for for children as well, can't you? 
Uh, on this device, it's the same pads. On on okay. other machines, um, yeah, it's separate pads and things. Separate. This, okay. This is the key, but it's still the mm -hmm. same pads. Okay. Um, and then, of, of course, is the little goodie bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, th this is. It's always that surreal moment. Um, first thing you're doing after, after you're on the phone to the and you're setting things up, the first thing you grab is, and there's always scissors in here somewhere. There's mm -hmm. scissors. There they are. Uh, and they're slightly serrated, and that's, you know, you, you as the first aider, you, you tend to you'll go into a little bit of shock. And mm -hmm. worlds just sort of your blinkers go on, and the world starts closing in. And mm -hmm. it's at this point, as you pick up the scissors and start, I've got to cut this person's clothes off. Mm -hmm. Oh, crap. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yep. it's, it's a bizarre moment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's an absolute bizarre moment. Um, you know, then, if well, it's come with it, I was, was going to say, does yeah. it come with a razor? Because sometimes you're going to have to, you might have to, someone might be really, really hairy. <laughs> yeah, and you get your alcohol pads and everything mm -hmm. else. See, and if anyone's actually watching this, they, they, they don't know first aid. Um, <clears throat> if for whatever reason the razor doesn't work or you've forgotten about it, don't panic. It will mm -hmm. still work. Um it's just you get a better connection uh, direct to the skin. Um, but if it's going through the hair follicles, um, mm -hmm. you know, unless they're like an absolute gorilla with... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if they're an absolute gorilla, just just get the pads and <laughs> best of luck. Keep hold of the scissors and use the scissors. Yeah. But yeah. Um, don't... Yeah, it's like don't panic about things because... You know, you're not there to do a nice little, um, you know, barber mm -hmm. job on, on the person's chest. You're there to save their bloody life. Mm -hmm. You got the little face mask as well. Um, if, I was different, and the advice changes as, as you'll have known yourself when you're doing the first aid and things. The advice mm -hmm. over the years has changed. It used to be, you know, two breaths and 30 compressions and and yep. stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> slightly different now. Uh, the it's the reliance is on the compressions. They've recently mm -hmm. advised still doing some breaths. Mm -hmm. but the compressions alone, what they're finding, especially with the extended ambulance response times, and I know for yeah. a fact that it's not the crews. The, the ambulance crews are doing everything they possibly humanly can do um, oh, yeah. they're being let down by their, their governments um, mm -hmm. but they're doing everything they possibly can do the, and that, but mm -hmm. the time it takes um, the patients uh, they're getting a CPR but their body is running out of oxygen mm -hmm. and it's not getting enough through from the compression alone so it's there. So this this is ready to go on onto another bus. So the first bus received their uh, defibrillator um, just over a week ago now, uh, and that was um, the company was Shuttle Buses. Mm -hmm. uh, employee-owned company, um, so it's not a big mega corporate or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they just goes in a nice little holder, <laughs> mm. that's into place, so it's not locked or anything. It just that's just goes in. <clears throat> that's just goes into the driver's cab somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, safely out the way of anything. But where the driver can still get to it, mm. uh, and it's just nicely wrapped into place. <laughs> I'm getting my cello tangled up, so it's just nicely strapped into place. Um, and it just sits there, 
and to actually check on it, all the driver has to do is look through that little lens. Mm -hmm. and hopefully, green light. hopefully mm -hmm. you'll see a little you know. green flash. There we go. Just yep. Just seen that little green flash. And yeah, that's every... you know that's working and that's operational. If mm -hmm. that's flashing red or yellow, and if you know smoke alarms, you remember those chirp, chirp, I'm yep. out of battery. Annoying little that's the same thing. So if it does any of that, uh, the bus driver knows to report the fault. Mm -hmm. uh, just take it out, to hand it into uh, the office. <coughs> <coughs> if the office is a spare, they'll just put the spare out in the bus mm -hmm. and then report this uh, to, to us and we'll organise a replacement as soon as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So it's usually within uh, a few days. Mm -hmm. um, no more than a week, depending on other circumstances. Uh, now, uh, what is the uh, what is the goal for uh, to get this? Uh, is it all of Scotland, eventually UK with the transit, um, maybe even Europe and beyond, or what's the? Well, yes, what's the... Um, to, to to a certain degree, yes. Um, uh, <clears throat> hopefully, um, we'll we'll target. Um, bus companies in Scotland first. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I mean, I was there's something like um, there's less than five thousand public service buses operating in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, it would cost roughly, I think it was like two point three million pounds per year mm -hmm. to fund it for every single bus company, and that sounds yeah. like a huge. <clears throat> that sounds like a huge, huge figure. Um, mm -hmm. But when I worked it out, compared to uh, the actual bus journeys operating um, each year in Scotland, I worked out less than three quarters of a penny mm -hmm. on on a fare. So someone comes on and says, wow. oh, I'm going to such and such, and they, they pay their, their two or three pounds, whatever it is, or their five pounds of that. Mm -hmm. Three quarters of one pence on each journey made would fund one of these in every single bus in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So the goal is maybe to, shall I say, encourage the bus companies to organise and buy their own. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're unsure about it or if, or if they want extra help, we'd be more than happy to... Uh, you know, and, and no profit to ourselves, we'd be more than happy to to help set it up for them mm -hmm. and, and, and put them onto some sort of uh, a maintenance program or schedule or something like that uh, and have all the all the stuff set up for them installed on the buses and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then just, they, they would just have to, you know, pay the appropriate fee themselves um, in the meantime, until we get to that sort of stage, uh, we are, are, are simply fundraising ourselves um, with mm -hmm. some generous donations um, from, from other people as well. And, and hopefully, um, if we start, um, you know, putting, putting ourselves out there and, you know, getting these defibrillators onto buses, we might even encourage the bus manufacturers uh, to actually do it as standard mm -hmm. to install a defibrillator onto the buses as a standard piece of equipment like a fire extinguisher or a first aid kit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that all comes as standard when you come in, uh, when a company orders a bus, regardless of all the extra spec and everything they can choose, if we can encourage the manufacturers to sell the first mm -hmm. defibrillator on the bus as standard, as part of the standard practice, that that would be the end goal. Um, and encouraging the the bus companies to keep on top of the maintenance and make sure uh, there's always one available. Um, the, the Scotland's population is aging. Um, and mm -hmm. 
the older that you get, the more at risk you are and things like that. Um, we also have this uh, bus pass scheme. So anyone disabled over the age of 60 or 65, something like that, mm-hmm. <clears throat> they'll get a, a bus pass issued from the government. Um, mm-hmm. And it means uh, they can travel um, by public transport and by buses uh, at taxpayer um, expense mm-hmm. um, as opposed to their own. Uh, so that does encourage um, older people to, yeah, it helps them get out of the house maybe a little bit more than they would. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, they're using buses as opposed to just organising their own transport. And that's where we're seeing the, you get the, the occasional news article where um, someone's life has been saved by a bus driver simply mm-hmm. because someone's fallen ill on the bus. I mean, mm-hmm. The thing is, you know, we only ever hear of the good news stories, but it happens so often. You know, someone's, I mean, the first cardiac arrest I was ever at, um, just an ordinary gentleman in his uh, 40s, it um, just decided he wasn't feeling very well. He, got, he just decided to step off the bus to get some fresh air. Um, and before he even stepped off the bus, he just hit the floor. Wow. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was it, and he passed away. Um, wow. Despite, you know, despite CPR being done, he passed away. There was, there was nothing. It was just, it was just gone. It just... Um, hmm. And, it, you know, all right, that was a number of years ago. Uh, the ambulance was pretty, pretty damn quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite it being a, a fairly rural community, um, and it still wasn't enough. Uh, but that was back in the days before, you know, defibrillators were really kind of commonplace, and they're mm-hmm. much more commonplace now. And we might, you know, <laughs> it would actually be nice to <clears throat> not just have them on buses, um, but in, we, we, we're seeing more and more um, community shops and pubs and and things like that they're all mm-hmm. uh, installing these for the public to use in an emergency so they'll mm-hmm. put them into little key code boxes outside their pub or shop um, and if you dial triple nine um, and see you know, or think, uh, someone having a heart attack someone in cardiac arrest there's uh, a defibrillator nearby what is the code and the triple nine operator will be able to tell you the code for that that box at your location mm-hmm. um so maybe maybe at some point it wouldn't be a bad idea to have them installed at bus stops mm-hmm. you know so every bus shelter could potentially have so it's not just the buses themselves but if you live mm-hmm. within walking distance um you know a sh- a minute or so away from a bus shelter, uh, if you know there's a defibrillator there, you'd be able to grab that mm-hmm. and take it back to the victim. To the another baby. place. Yeah, and another place could be maybe a park as well, a park shelter or public restroom. You, you do, yeah. <coughs> we are starting to see them more and more in um, mm-hmm. public places where larger crowds gather. Mm-hmm. Um, so most shopping centres have them now, I think. Almost every shopping centre in Scotland has them. Um, uh, I think almost every supermarket now has at least one. Mm. Um, so it is becoming more and more commonplace. But as as you know, you know, seconds count. Mm-hmm. You know, the ambulance is only minutes away. If you can get one of these onto a patient within the first 60 seconds, the first minute or two, Mm -hmm. there's a real chance that that person can survive. Yeah. There's a real chance that, you know, by the time the ambulance crew have arrived, you've been keeping them alive long enough. Uh, You've been keeping 
the blood circulating, you've been keeping, uh, you know, the, the oxygen getting into their body mm. to prevent, mm -hmm. you know, brain death <clears throat> um, and things like that long enough for the paramedics to take over, for them to get transported for surgery if that's what they need. Um, you know, but the surgery, the transport, everything else is almost worthless if the person has been deprived of oxygen and blood circulation uh, for, you know, 20 minutes. The ambulance crew is just going to show up and go, nah, they're gone. And mm -hmm. load them up, we'll take them in. Yeah. And sometimes, and uh, uh, what I've heard from uh, ambulance crews in the uh, in the past is that if there's a close family member there, they will do a token attempt, knowing fine well that the person's long gone. Mm -hmm. But they'll still do um, the theatrics, um, not for the patient, but for the relative who's bawling their eyes out. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I've I've seen it where, you know, you've maybe got a little girl standing at the side, absolutely bawling her eyes out because, <clears throat> you know, their their grandparent is is just lying there dead in the street. Um, and you know, there's no much you can do. Um, and you're just trying to minimize the shock. Um, and you're hoping someone's just taking them to the side and hiding their eyes, shielding their eyes um, from the, the more graphic parts. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and it's it's a horrible thing to see, an absolute horrible thing to see. But if you have if you have CPR training, if you have a defibrillator, there's a real chance of helping someone survive long enough mm. to get the professional help. And these do make all the difference. Um, and I would, I would hope, I would encourage as many people as possible um, just to, to, to make sure, you know, even, even just clubbing together with some neighbours um, and putting one at the corner of your street mm. until cabinet, you know, or you know, putting putting together and getting one installed into your local bus stop or something. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference if something happens with one of your neighbours and the relatives know there's a defibrillator there, they can grab it and go back and start trying to keep the loved one alive. And it really does make a difference. Yeah. And it does. Yeah, and the more there are out there, every single one out on the street somewhere, be it in a bus or be it a bus shelter or be it outside a pub or a mm -hmm. shopping centre or anything else like that, every single one out there means someone is closer to life-saving equipment than they maybe otherwise would be. So it doesn't matter if, if you can afford to sponsor one, or organise one yourself for your community, brilliant, go for it. Um, you will not regret it. Because it's, it's it's that classic saying, you'd rather have one and never need it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what matters. That's mm -hmm. what we need. Exactly. And that's that's what my wife and I are, are you know, as libertarians, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to encourage a free market solution um, to to make sure that this, uh, you know, this happens without the need to go to the taxpayers or ask the government to legislate. <coughs> Good ideas don't need force. I mean, no. well, anyone we've offered this to, we've had very little resistance from it. It's the usual, oh, but what if a driver doesn't know how to use it and things like that? So look, look, well, arrange training, it is very simple and they're self-explanatory. You open it up, you switch it on, it tells you what to do. Mm -hmm. If you want to phone 
if you're you're going to be stopped, you're going to be on the phone to the triple nine operator, another human mm-hmm. being. They they're very skilled at being able to explain these things over the telephone, yeah. um, and they will be able to talk you through and keep you calm as you are um, in the process. Uh, you know of potentially saving someone's life. Mm-hmm. But, you know, 40 quid a month for one, it's not a huge ask. No. Um, and there are, uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with the social media pages or or onto the website, um, there'll be a link in, in your uh, channel somewhere, no doubt. Um, when this goes It'll out. all be... It'll be in the description down below, so we'll have all the links. Awesome. Um, And if anyone, even if all the conspires one pound a month, that's one pound closer to getting another defibrillator out in the streets. Um, So, yeah, uh, that is our goal. And we, you know, we're human beings. It doesn't matter what the person's political affiliation is or the colour of their skin, mm-hmm. anything else. Exactly. The fibrillators work. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't want to see anyone lying there dying in the street um, because someone doesn't have the equipment that could potentially save their lives. So mm-hmm. that's what matters at the end of the day. Absolutely. So, and 40, 40 quid, I mean, for all you Americans out there, that's 51 dollars and 46 cents so for over a little over 50 dollars i mean you could help out to at least be prepared to save a life so i mean and uh what was it what was it called stephen public transport automated defib- defibrillators uh yeah so P- yeah p-t-a-d hyphen scotland.org.uk um is where the website will be mm-hmm. um and uh, the, the social media uh, at PTSD underscore Scotland um, for, for Twitter or X as it is now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's great. We'll, we'll, we'll start seeing some stories uh, with, to get some, hopefully getting a little bit of uh, press attention with it as well. Um, and we'll see if there's a couple of politicians who... There's always a couple of politicians wanting to get their face in a paper somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, take advantage of my tax money um, and get a, an elected politician down to have the photograph taken with a bus or something. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, use and abuse the politicians for your own benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Almost, almost sounds very stat- statist and lefty of me. Um, <laughs> Hey, you gotta if, use them. Yeah, and if if they weren't standing um, for a photograph for me, they'd be standing for a photograph for someone else. So I'm mm-hmm. not really costing the taxpayer any any extra. <laughs> You're adversely pos- yeah tax rebate. You're adversely possessing your own taxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I, to, I think I, that's oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I used to crack. Um, pretty crude jokes about that you know what what do you call it when you get money off a drug addict uh, a tax rebate <laughs> it's, it's, not it's, wrong <laughs> not wrong crude, crude jokes nope. I've, I've got a reputation to uphold people think I'm an evil bastard so um, yeah I, I can't keep doing this lovey stuff lovey right. dovey stuff you know and um, that's supposed to be secret and I it is unusual. Um, it's very unusual for me to be on a podcast talking about charitable stuff, um, because mm-hmm. I'm usually on a podcast slagging off politicians and and mm-hmm. being that evil right wing madman, the the gun nut, and all sorts. So, um, yes. literally Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> just, see, see if I get the shadow just right off the light. There we go. Is that? Is that my little Hitler mustache? Uh, the uh, shadow? I think that's the toothpick. You know, so so, but I I think it's it's wonderful uh, what you and your wife are doing, and and as an agorist myself, 
or or as Konkin would say, a left libertarian, uh, even though we're to the left of ANCAP. Um, it, I think it's wonderful to counter all the mechanisms that are all the all the obstacles in place. I um, mean, and using the market, the agora for what it's meant to for, and that's the to bring a service or to bring a good, use what you have to try to help people. I mean, you can't, I mean, you have issues with government services. I mean, why not do something that actually helps them too? So while they're running behind, you're, you're saving someone's life to hold on so that they can finally, when they get there, they can help out. They can finally take over. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know. So, just every, every minute counts, mm -hmm. and the earlier someone gets a treatment, the better the chances I have. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, the body's going to do its own thing, and when someone's time is up, their time is up. Yeah, um, exactly. But if you know you've you've done your CPR, you've you've uh, made use of a defibrillator and things like that. The paramedics mm -hmm. have came as quick as they can. You guys have done everything you possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. Hold your head up high. Um, don't be disheartened just because the chances are someone will st still die despite your efforts. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing. If it's that person's time, it's that person's time. There's nothing you can do. It's completely out of your control. If you've done everything, you possibly can, then you know that's all anyone can ask of you. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, this has been a, a great conversation. A little bit different there, Andrew. So we got to Absolutely. get away from politics. We got to troll some politics, but we got to get to some wholesome stuff. And I like what you're doing, Stephen. And uh, and I, I wish you the best. And I. I we could probably go on for days about it and just talk about it. I know it's just defibrillator. Yeah, def I can't talk. AED. <laughs> AEDs. Yeah, I know it's just an AED. I know it's just first aid, CPR, but it's, I mean, we literally could probably talk for days about it because it's it's something positive and something that to look forward to. But we are running kind of behind, as always, Andrew. We, we try to try for one hour and we always go over. So. Yeah. So um, to close out, you have anything to any concerns, comments, questions to to, to finish out for Stephen there, Andrew? I just think Mr. This is a very good, I think this is a very good trend. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the more resources and the less complicated they are, the better off people are going to be in long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the goal, you know, to, to one of the goals. Well, one of the goals is to, to demonstrate that you know, we don't need government, we don't need tax to do something that mm -hmm. is right. Yep. Yeah. Good ideas don't need force. That's right. Exactly. You just need to understand we're all human beings and we need to build relationships again, even if it's just for a short time. So Yeah, if if you if you hadn't to discover it was some sort of left wing pink haired multi-trans person um and you know you've you've done the cpr you you've administered the defibrillator that um mm -hmm. they're covering the hospital a few days later um you can you know if they want to say thanks that's fine if they don't that's fine but you can you know as soon as they're fit enough you can get back to slagging them off on twitter it's all that's good right <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> maybe they'll touch grass too when they get they get free they get a little they bit better. The they they just, <laughs> they'll just touch the grass forever, and then they'll so, smoke it. Maybe that we may, that might be what we're missing in this life. We all just need to just burn one. <laughs> <laughs> if everybody just smoked a joint a day, we'd all be happier. So <laughs> we'd all be healthier too, probably. So, but um. Before we get on too much of a tangent, uh, again, thank you again, Stephen. Um, yes, to close out, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for coming on and and discussing with us about life saving techniques. So, um, but him in the Spooner shirt—that's Andrew Joseph. 
I am Zachary Kaiser, the legacy of Jennifer Ant Kaiser. That's Stephen McNamara. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you for sharing. All of the info will be down in the description. So we haven't plugged it enough. This is the legacy, right? And uh, I guess we can go ahead and take off. So. Bon, bon voyage. Thanks for watching. Peace. See ya.